Uh, I, didn't, I didn't mention this earlier. You'll see these little uh, cards. Uh, I just want to encourage you uh, to take, a, take a, a moment and walk down the street in your neighborhood and, and hand these out to people. If you have somebody that you want to, uh, don't miss an opportunity to do that uh, as we think about that just little invitation for our Vacation Bible School. Well, I want to encourage you to turn to the little book of Titus in your Bibles, uh, whether you're using an online resource or one in your hand. A uh, little book of Titus is almost at the very end of your, of your Bibles. It's the second to the last little letter that the Apostle Paul wrote uh, to one of his protégés, uh, a man by the name of Titus, and hence it gets its name. Uh, it's directed to him. But as you read the letter, it becomes pretty obvious that he's writing to Titus uh, and he anticipates uh, that people will want to read the book over his shoulder uh, because the letter itself is written in such a way to authorize Titus as Paul's representative, as his delegate in a place uh, where Titus is going to be acting on the behalf of Paul the Apostle. And so he refers to Titus as his genuine, his true son in the faith, to authenticate him and to vest him with all the authority and standing that he needs to work with what seems to be a church that uh, is, if it, it's up and running, there's some people who believed in Jesus, but it doesn't have any structure, it doesn't have any leaders, uh, it doesn't have a sense of how it should organize itself as a family uh, to follow Jesus. And so Titus is going to be sent there to help this church to get up and running. Now, He's, uh, we're, we're, we're pulling off our title, Healthy Church, from the idea that uh, Titus is, is instructed that if this church is to be up and running and to become a church and to have these things that are left undone, to have them uh, uh, put in the ground and have them established, uh, Titus is, is to do these things. And so to have a healthy church, you need these basic things up and running. And so he's going to say you need healthy leadership. And so the very first thing that you need is you need the right kind of leaders for the church uh, to make sure that it keeps a sense of its identity, of its direction, right, of its purpose. Uh, so you need healthy leaders. And then he's going to go into chapter two and say, well, you need a healthy family. And so he's going to speak to the various members of the family, men and women, uh, old and young. And he's going to talk to them about what a healthy Christian family life looks like. Uh, and then when you get to chapter three, he's going to come back and say, well, you need to think about your face to the outside world. What kind of witness do you have? What kind of presence do you have in the outside world? How do you think about people who aren't followers of Jesus? How do you relate to them? How do you love them? And then all along the way, Titus is, is going to use resources from what God has revealed about himself to ground or to found all of those instructions. So those instructions aren't just simply that, that, that the Apostle Paul is pulling out of his head. They're things that he feels are demanded or necessary for the people of God, given what God has done, given what Christ has made possible among them, given who he's called them to be. And so we'll see that in chapter one and chapter two and chapter three. So as we work along, we get an idea of a healthy church. Now, one of the things that we have done uh, as he gives his checkup right on the church here to see what's going on, we're going to th we'll look through, and if we were to uh, develop a set of questions that Paul would ask for a healthy church, we're going to ask those questions of ourselves as we work through the book in Titus. But we've chosen as a church to memorize these verses together over the period of time, and so every time we speak, you're going to see these up here for these two months. But I want to encourage you, whether it's you individually or your family, uh, that you read through these, uh, and these kind of get at the core idea of the book of Titus. So let's just read them together. Would you stand with me and could we read them together? Uh, these verses here in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to uh, 14. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading. You may be seated. 
So that's our, our verses that we're kind of using to work our way through. And so I want to encourage you to memorize those, to look through those, uh, that what God has done in Christ teaches us to say no to an old way of life and to say yes to Jesus to follow him. And we're, we're doing that in anticipation that he's going to come and complete everything that he's promised us yet to come. And so we're a group of people who live in hope. We're a group of people who have a sense of purpose, but we're also a group of people that know that we haven't arrived yet, that we're, that we're still vulnerable, that we still need to lean in on Christ. And we're a people that are looking forward to the fulfillment of everything. And so we're also a group of people that realizes that everything that we long for will not be had in this life. You can't get the, the perfect job that will satisfy you deeply. You can't get the perfect spouse that will satisfy you completely. You can't have enough money. You can't be healthy enough. You can't have an Instagram body worthy enough, right? You can't get any of that enough. We're waiting for it yet in the future. But the foretaste of it, the beginning of it starts now in a relationship with Jesus Christ where he extends his loving favor to rescue us from the punishment we deserve and to give us the life that we don't deserve. And as we start that, we live into that today. And so we have, a, we have a calling to be his people and a call of a group of people who are ready to do what's good. And we're going to talk about what that is as we work our way through. Now, we've talked here about the kind of questions that kind of arise then from Titus if we were to use Titus and ask about, is our church healthy? Well, the first question we asked last week is, what is the governing authority in our church? What tells us who we are? Uh, what we're to be about. And we talked about, as Titus opened up, that, that it's the apostles' teaching. It's what God has revealed about himself and his purposes through his authorized representatives. That's the prophets in the Old Testament and the apostles in the New, right? They're our authority. We don't look to uh, a contemporary newspaper or news source. We don't look to uh, any other ancient historical writings. When we try to figure out, well, who am I as a Christian? What should I be about? Well, we turn to the writings where God has revealed who he is and what we should be up to. So the scriptures are our guide, and so we teach from that. And today it's going to become obvious when we think about uh, who are the, those that the church believes are qualified to lead. And so the issue we're going to talk about today, the very first thing when he comes to this church, and you'll see it in verse 5, he says, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders... Now, the term for pastors or overseers, all the same person, elders in every town as I directed you. And so Paul envisions that there's little groups of Christians in these towns, right? Crete is an island in the middle of the Mediterranean. It's about 160 some miles long. There's a few little islands, a few little cities dotted around. And Paul, visiting there or becoming aware of it, recognizes that there's little pockets of believers in little towns. And he says, well, we need some leadership there to help these people to grow for their protection, for their blessing, right, for them to grow in Christ. And so, Titus, you need to go and appoint elders or pastors in each one of these cities. And so, that's what Titus is up, up to. And so, the first thing comes, right, is, well, what kind of leader should he have? Who should he pick? Now, it's, it's probably pretty clear that Titus knew all of this material before he went because he wouldn't have been sent by Paul if he didn't think that this is what a leader should be. And matter of fact, it's pretty clear that Titus met these qualifications already. The letter is written so that the people that are going to be reading it and that Titus is going to be ministering to can know that what Titus is looking for and the qualities he's looking for in a leader are the ones the apostle Paul says are ones that are mandated by God, right? So Titus knew these already. Titus is already living in line with these, but he's coming here, and this letter allows people to read in and say, no, this is what the Apostle Paul is really requiring, and these are the kind of leaders that we should have, because what we're going to find out about the people in Crete is that this is not the kind of people that the culture around them would admire. Right? So the leaders that are going to come in this church are going to be countercultural to the island of Crete. Right? So it's a, it's a very different thing. So we're going to look at that. Now, uh, I, I pulled this off Dilbert, right? If you're familiar with the comic Dilbert. Uh, if you start, if you punch in leadership, right, into uh, Google, or you go into Amazon and look at uh, books on leadership, and you come, I mean, you will get tens of thousands of hits, literally, right? You'll get, everybody has an idea about what it means to be a leader, and leadership books are a dime a dozen. So here's uh, his boss coming up. I'm reading a great management book about the rules of leadership. Allow me to put that in context, Dilbert says. There are probably 10,000 books about leadership, and each one has a different approach. 
and there are millions of real le uh, leaders of which no two are alike. Moreover, every situation is unique and requires a different type of leader, and yet this one author has found a magic formula to transform you from a gullible baboon into a great leader. And that makes sense because all great leaders throughout history achieve success by reading a random book. Right? And he said, I don't like that context. Right? So Dilbert says, not many people do. Right? Uh, and the issue it is a very confusing thing about what it means to be a leader in this moment. And of course, for us as a culture, all you have to look at is the political arena to try to see how confusing and diverse the ideas are about what a leader should be and what they should be about. Right? So here we want to talk about in the church itself, where do we get some help about who a leader is and what a leader should be like, all right? Now I want to read first our section today, and it's in Ch Titus chapter 1, verse 5, and then we want to start looking at the various aspects of who's qualified to lead and why we need healthy leaders, okay? Two things. So would you read with me? I'm going to read first uh, uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless. There's a key term if you want to underline that. Uh, if you're an underliner, uh, uh, that term is going to show up twice and it's going to be the, the overarching category in which all the other qualities fit into. He might be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless. Now, there's another word you may want to uh, underline there. Key idea is a manager, an overseer who manages God's household. It's actually a, a phrase that's used to translate one word is just a steward of God's household. Someone who's charged by the owner of the house. And here the, the, the imagery is the church is God's family is that a, a leader is someone who's put in charge by God to manage his family according to the family's heads, desires, and goals, right? So a steward doesn't do his own thing. A steward doesn't come in and determine what kind of church he wants to have. He doesn't come in and tell the people, you're my people, this is my church. He doesn't use any of that language because this is God's church and his people, and his job is to steward this group of people according to God's desires and his purposes, according to their identity and their mission, right? It's the same sort of idea that uh, any of you that have been a babysitter or have hired a babysitter, they are a steward of your children, Right? And so when you hire them and they come over, you don't tell them, you know, hey, here's some kids, you do with them what you want. Right? Most parents who hire a babysitter, they leave a list of things right, that you're supposed to do, and the oldest child that's left behind will inform the babysitter if they missed anything. Right? So if you were the oldest child, you'd probably do that. No, we didn't do that in our house. We didn't do that in our house. Right? So we, we had to we had to, uh, we'd, we'd have a babysitter come over when the girls were younger, and we'd tell them what their bedtimes were, what they could eat and couldn't eat. Uh, we'd tell them what shows they could watch and couldn't watch. We'd tell the, the little routine that they were supposed to go through, and so forth and so on. And we said, here, and then we would have to turn to our daughters and say, she's in charge. She's in charge. You're not in charge. She's in charge, right? So she's going to do these kind of things. Going. But when we came home, when we evaluated the babysitter, we didn't evaluate her based on her own perception of what she should be doing as a babysitter. She said, I thought you guys were too strict, so I kept your kids up till 10, and I fed them chocolate for two hours. I said, no, 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 that's wrong. No, 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 I'm the babysitter. I'm in charge. Well, no, you don't understand what it means to be a babysitter. You're fired, Right? So a babysitter is a steward over something that doesn't belong to them, and they steward in accordance with the desires of the people who are responsible. So the people of God belong to him. Jesus is the one that died for us. He brought us to himself. He's made us new. We belong to him. We've been bought with a price. We're not our own. And so anybody who is a leader of God's people is a caretaker of what God has rescued and what God has done and what God's going to do. Right? So it's a key idea here that we think about what a leader is here, a God steward. So he continues with what a God steward, the kind of character qualities that he continues. Not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it, right? So this is the, the, the character, the qualities of a leader. 
Now, I have, the, I have the, 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 the response when I read that list, and there's a list very close to that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, where Paul is, is adjusting the church in Ephesus. I have the same feeling as a pastor when I read that list that I have as a husband when I do weddings and give vows to people. Right? So I'm the, I, 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 they repeat the vows after me. And it, is, it has happened to me over and over again. I can't do a wedding, and I've done a lot of them, uh, where it isn't a moment that makes me reflect on how I'm keeping my vows. Having to hold till death do us part, I will keep myself to you and you only as long as we both shall live. Right? All those kind of things like that, I can't have every moment. And when I read this passage, I think about my own life as a pastor. And I come away from this week, as Sarah prayed, I come away from this week having repented over sin. I come away from this week having struggled with past regrets. I was sleeping last night and I had something come back to me as I was laying down of something I'd done in the past and I had to deal with a past sin again in my head. And as I think about those things, well, am I qualified to be this man? Should I be in this place, right? As I deal with my own fallenness, and we're going to talk about what this assumes about the individual who's here uh, in terms of that uh, uh, set of qualities. And so if you have your notes, I want you to pull those out. I want to fill in some kind of prefaces to these uh, qualities that we're going to work through that are important for us to get as we look through these qualities, Okay, you'll see there's a number of statements here. Men who live out the apostolic teaching, a blameless man. Okay, let me say this here. Okay, number one, you'll see it in your notes. It's a general category, blameless is a general category that gets fleshed out in two separate sections. So it's introduced as a blameless man. You'll see it here uh, in verse six, and then he returns and repeats it again in verse seven, right? So it's getting fleshed out all the way through. These are the qualities of, you're saying, well, what does it mean to be a blameless person? Well, Paul says, let me help you. I'm going to spell it out. So blameless is the general category, and the specifics are laid out here below. Okay. Now, uh, two, it assumes a standard against which an elder is judged. Right? So if you're, if you're judging a, a given pastor, if you're trying to determine they're blameless, you've got to say, well, what's, what's the standard that I use? What standard did I use? That standard is that he should be a steward. And that's what I was talking to you about here. He should be a steward, right? Someone who is entrusted with God's work and who is to carry it out as his representative, a steward, S-T-E-W-A-R-D, a steward, right? So if you're a steward, that's what you're looking for, and that's what Paul says here. So I'm the babysitter. I'm not, I'm not the person who gets to decide what to do. I'm someone who's called to invest in to love, to encourage, to watch over the people that God puts in my trust with God's intentions and his purposes in mind. And so if I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus, if I see people under my care that God has entrusted to me walking away from Jesus, I'm on my knees praying for them to turn back to him and I'm going to be engaging in their life to say, don't walk away from Christ. No, there's no life in that path. Don't go that way. Don't walk away from your marriage. Don't walk away from your commitment to Christ. No, don't respond to that situation that way. If I see someone, on the other hand, moving toward Christ and growing in him, coming more and more into their identity as Christ, I'm cheering over here on the other side, right? Because I want people to follow Jesus. I want them to know him and follow him. So uh, the, the, the steward is to reflect God in who he is as well as in what he does, Right? So this is one of the things here. One of the characteristics of a charlatan is someone who talks a lot about God but doesn't live what they talk. And this is why, you know, I tell, I, I'm involved in training uh, people for ministry all the time, and I tell them, you are signing up to live in a glass house, okay? And if you don't like it, and if, if it's a guy or, and you're getting married, you, you better make sure that the woman that you're getting married to is, is, is happy to live in a glass house, Right? There are things that happen in a pastoral interview that you could not do in, a, in a, an employment environment because it would be illegal to ask those questions. Right? Because you're, you're asking about not only that person's character, you're looking for references in it, but you want to know about their relationship to their wife. You want to know how they are as a father in their family. You want to know, and this is why one of the hardest things as a church, when you're looking, if you're calling a pastor from outside of your congregation, to actually get a look into their family, it's difficult, right, to get a sense of who they are. Because we all know the phenomenon where we can all put on a good face at least for a couple hours, 
right? You can maybe suppress your kids even for at least a couple hours, right? You can bribe them into compliance, right? We're all hitting, right, the ice cream store afterwards just if you guys don't blow up right now. Okay, all right, mom, we'll hang in there, right? That's different than saying that they have a consistent pattern of, of, of discipline and loving their kids well, right? Those kind of ideas. So the idea here is we're looking for someone who reflects it in their life as well as what they do. And, and the core idea is they hold firmly, is the idea is going to talk, they hold firmly to what God has taught. Their life is actually shaped by the truth of God's scripture. Okay, it's a key idea. Now, number three, the qualities that he gives assume a man is the only one who could be a leader, right? That's probably one of the most controversial things I'm going to say, uh, aside from all the character issues here, is that uh, Paul doesn't go after it in detail here, but all the qualities assume that it's going to be a male, not a male, as in any man is, man is qualified. It's only the qualified men who can apply for the role of a pastor as a servant leader in their congregation. If you want to get more explicit argument from Paul, you can go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 15, and read down through there carefully. God has set an order, a sacred order, that the right kind of man is to be the leader within the church. And so here at Emmanuel, you, as you look at our documents, you will find that we call elders who are male, but not just men. We call men who meet the qualities of a leader, an elder, right, in terms of that. We have all kinds of roles for women to play, uh, but that's one role that we do not ordain women to the position of an elder. We have ordained women to missionary status. We've commissioned them off. We put our uh, 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 authorization on a whole group of women who serve in our Women's Discipleship Council here, right, that are charged with discipling our women, right? We have many, many influential and important roles, but we submit to God's requirements and look for the right kind of men to serve in that thing. So three, number four, not all the descriptors must apply, not all the descriptors must apply, but they must be met if they do apply, okay? Now, let me make clear about this one. You will notice that what it says here uh, is that he must be uh, faithful to his wife and a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient, right? Do you see that part, right? Now, there are groups of people that say, well, if you're not married, you can't be a pastor, right? And so the, the, one of the problems with that is Paul nor Timothy would qualify to be a pastor, okay? Or Titus, right? None of them were married, uh, and they were all serving in leadership roles within the church. And matter of fact, if you read about Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says his, his preferred opinion, right? He says this is not uh, good or right for everyone because not everyone's gifted, but he said, I would prefer that you would be single like myself because you can have an undivided devotion to God. Now, if we had somebody who was at an undivided devotion to God, I don't think that we need to say, uh, according to Scripture, that it, as long as you get married, then you'll be okay, right? So the issue here is, if the person is married, they should be a person who's faithful to their wife. And the, the literal phrase is a one-woman man, which simply means it's a quality of him that he's faithful to his wife. Right? I only have eyes for you, right? idea. Right? But the second one then, if you would try to be literal and push that out, that he rules his children, if you were trying to say that all the qualities have to apply to each person, you would have to say that the person is not only married, but they have to have kids. So a, a couple that got married and couldn't have children for whatever reason, they wouldn't qualify. Or if they only had one child, they wouldn't qualify because they have to have multiple. Right? Now, these are not qualities that are, you have to have to be a pastor, but if you are married, well, then you should have a particular relationship with your wife. And if you do have children, there should be a, a, a pattern of you disciplining and, tre and te treating them and teaching them in such a way that they're people who are respectful, right? Now, I want to say one thing about that one quality there uh, because it says here, uh, it's actually a very... Uh, extended translation of what happens here in the NIV, which uh, I want to disagree with just a little bit. Uh, that, uh, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. One of the most uh, difficult interpretive decisions in this passage is that translation of the word believe. Okay? The other translation for that is faithful, right, or respectful. Now, the reason why I disagree with the translation that's here is I disagree with it on theological grounds, and theological grounds is there's one thing that I can't make happen, 
in the lives of my daughters. There's one thing that no parent in here can make happen in the lives of their kids is they can't guarantee that their kids will be saved. All of us who love Jesus, we wish that our kids had, you know, a little panel on their chest and you could, you know, when they're asleep and they're looking angelic and they're laying there, right, you just pop it off and you would, you would flip all the right buttons, right? The God button, the be nice to your brother button, right? Don't speak back to your mother button, right? Well, all those buttons, we'd like to push them, right? That isn't the way life works. And one of the things, when, when you have a child in your home, two things I began to pray as soon as I found that Ronna was pregnant, two things, literally from the times I found that she was pregnant, I prayed for Ronna for a safe delivery, and I prayed, and we pray this for our grandkids, for, as soon as they're able, Lord, please, would you draw them to yourself? As soon as they're able. I can commend Jesus, I can teach them about Jesus, I can respond to my own failures as a follower of Christ and apologize and, and deal with my failures, but I can't make people choose Jesus. Um, and here, uh, to hold a person accountable for something they can't do, I don't think is what Paul's intention is. Uh, he's, you can hold a parent accountable for how they parent their kids, whether they do it wisely or unwisely, but you can't be ultimately responsible for whether or not your child embraces Jesus or not, right? And this is also, I want to say this too, there's uh, an inappropriate way of reading. Proverbs 22, 6 is one of the infamous passages, right? You raise up a child in the way to go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. Well, to read that as a, if you do A, B will always occur, is to misread the nature of Proverbs. Proverbs has given you the normal course of things, all things being equal. That's what usually happens. The way a child is raised, they usually follow in that path. But the scriptures are full of examples of people who are, are raised by godly people who don't follow that path. And so it's not a guarantee. And so you have many parents sometimes, especially if you have an adult child who's turned away from the Lord, they say, well, it's all my fault. If I'd have done a better job as a parent, then my child would be where they are. No, there's a point where if you've loved Christ and you've owned your own stuff, and some of it, yeah, we all have regrets. But it's the child has to take on the responsibility of their own relationship to Jesus Christ. And that's not something you can be responsible for, right? It doesn't mean that you don't still keep praying. It doesn't mean that you don't still keep loving. It doesn't mean that your heart doesn't ache. But you can't be responsible for a child who says, I don't want your Jesus, right? So key things here about this one, right? Number five, um, then, is looking for a pattern of life, not perfection, right? So uh, a pattern of life, not perfection. And so any of you who know me, any of you who've known me for any length of time, right, any of the, the ladies and, and men who've worked with me closely over the years know that Greg has some character flaws. They know that there's certain things. Uh, between my wife and I, my wife, one of the things that she's just busy, busy all the time, one thing, you give Rana a job and she takes it on, you know it will be fulfilled and probably within the next 10 minutes if it's possible. Right? I mean, it's just the way she is. I, I, I struggle as a man. I've always struggled with it way back in college. I tell my students this. I'm a procrastinator. It's one of the most frustrating things about me, right? So I got a doer who just gets at she Ron is the person that when she was in school, right, if you got your syllabus, she had her whole semester planned like day two. Right? I'm looking at the syllabus and say, what's due tomorrow? Right? Oh, I got, I got 10 papers. Well, when do they do? Uh, that's like three months from now. We'll get there. Right? So I, I know I have a whole bunch of students in my, my classes are like that. And so I start, I don't have a big project. Literally, I start like a month ahead and I go, you know, hey, you know what today would be? And they're looking at me and I said, you know what today? Today would be a great job for all you procrastinators to start that major paper today. It'd be a great day for that. Ha, 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 And I know they're not going to do it, right? But I'm going to tell them, right, for like four weeks or what? Next week I come back and go, hey, you know what would be a great day today to do? It'd be a great time to start your paper. Ha, 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 right? And then I start to see them get panicked. And it goes out, and I tell them, I even use the illustration. I said, some of you will turn papers into me that'll look like the guy who goes to the gym and he only works out his biceps and chest all the time, right? He's got big biceps, big chest, and then he's got these little stick legs that come down that you wonder if he can hold up his torso with them, right? And I saw some of you, you'll have a paper that'll just be just like that. It'll start off, it'll have a first two pages, it'll be great, and then it'll just piddle out to nothing. And every time, I'll get students right back to, Dr. Kowser, you were right. This is what I did. Can I have some grace, right? Uh, it just happens all the time. Uh, so 
I, I have imperfections. I have failures. I have, I, I, I struggle with being passive aggressive. I deal with my own insecurities. Uh, one, of the, one of the struggles that I have all the time is I write, usually when I write things, they're well received, but to write them is just a painful process for me. My mind undermines my confidence as I write. And so I, I just have to wrestle through it. I always hand it to people to read it, and usually it's good feedback, but I always hand it, hand it to them thinking that they're just going to throw it in the trash because it's got to be crappy, right? And that's all a mind game that I have going on in my own head. And some of us have voices from the past that undermine our confidence. A dad that never affirmed us, a failure that we had, right? A, a moment when we did something, we stuck ourselves out and everybody laughed about it and that just keeps coming back to us all the time and it and hinders us in different ways. So if you're looking for perfection, you might find it in Steve Ruffner over here, but don't talk to Emily. You might find it in Steve Ruffner, but you're not gonna find it in me, right? Or Will or Van, right? We love each other, we have flaws, but we're looking for patterns. Is this true about the person? Is he a guy that just gets angry all the time? Is he angry all the time? Right? Is he a guy that, that really doesn't love what is good? These are the kind of qualities that we're going to look at. And so uh, as we look here, we're looking for a pattern of life. So what are these qualities? And let me, let me just uh, give you a kind of an idea here. I made a list of them, and I kind of broke it up in a little bit of a different way uh, than what we have here. I put all the positive qualities on one side, all the negative qualities that things that shouldn't be a part of the person on the other side. And what Paul does, he begins with faithful to his wife and raises faithful children. Then he switches over to the negative, and then he comes back with hospitable, lover of the good, prudent, upright, devout, self-control. Okay? So those are the qualities that are listed here, and he kind of introduces two positive qualities, comes back with negative things that shouldn't be there, and then goes back with a list of positive qualities. Now, this person is to be God's steward, and the important thing here is that these are not qualities that you look to the secular culture to fill in, right? These are kind of abstract notions. Well, what does it mean to be prudent? Well, to be prudent is to be judged over against what God has revealed about himself, about what's important for human beings, about what really is significant and about what they should be doing. So it's God's teaching, the, the firm uh, faith, that he has, the faith that he has passed on through the apostles, that's to be the standard, Right? So God is the one who sets the standard. We have to meet his approval, not the culture's approval, not a, not a, a family member's approval, right? Not anybody else's. So to be God's steward, we meet these qualities in accordance with what God expects. And so we live it out. The steward is to live it out. So all these qualities have to do with the character of his life. But he's also so firmly embedded by life and word into God's word that he can disciple other peoples in it and he can defend it, right? And we'll come back to those in just a moment, right? So just some, some things here that if you're looking at uh, a person here, you're looking, do they live out what they profess to believe? Do they live it out? Do they embrace it, Right? Do, does it shape their family life? Does it shape the way they relate to their wife? Does it shape the way they talk to and relate to their kids? Does it shape their behavior when, when something goes bad? How do they respond to that? And if you just listen to them over a period of time, what do they really love? What, do they really, what are they really passionate about? Right? These are the kind of qualities. So he gives these here, these negative qualities. We'll begin over here when he says, not reckless right? This is kind of, a, it doesn't live recklessly, okay? And what, what when you want to think about it, he's not unaware or uncaring about the impact of his life on other people, right? He doesn't live recklessly. He doesn't go after life in such a way that, I don't care, it's their problem, right? They just have to deal with it, right? This has been a big discussion point when it has to do with, with uh, you know, hearers, heroes, hearers, heroes in our culture, especially athletes, right? There was a time when they, they were encouraged to be a role model, and you'll have many professional athletes say, I'm not a role model. Don't look to me as a role model. I don't want the burden of trying to be a certain kind of person, and if I am any kind of role model, I'm a role model to do whatever you want to do and don't care about what people think about you, right? Now, there is a certain sense in which as a believer, you want to follow Jesus and not care about what other people think about you, but a person who follows Jesus is concerned about the wake that their life is leaving in the lives of other people. Because it is leaving a wake, right? As you at home, right, and you're in front of your TV set and something goes wrong, the way you respond to it, or when your neighbor messes up your yard, 
or when the person almost drives you off the road, right? The way you respond in that moment reveals something about your character and it's teaching the people around you to respond that way, right? Big thing that went viral uh, over the last couple of days was a mom and a kid riding down through a little suburban neighborhood and the kid's on a scooter and the mom's on a bike and he comes down, he sees an American flag planted in the grass. He goes over, tries to pull it up, misses it the first time, go grabs it the next time and then throws it down on the yard, stomps on it and, and they go off. Well, there was a big division of opinion about whether that mom was a good mom or not, right, in terms of that. So the idea here is, as we're thinking about these, I, you're concerned about what your behavior does. So I, I don't come and just say whatever I want to say. I don't drink whatever I want to drink. I don't go everywhere I want to go. I don't do those things because I'm thinking about the impact of my life on the lives of other people. Not rebellious, right? It's not somebody who inherently, you see a line, right? Some of you joke about that. Uh, the only thing that happens to you when you see a line is that now you have a target to step over, right? So, and sometimes we feel that about our own kids, right? That you get a line, and that means it just raises something up in you, and you're just a person who says, I, I just don't go with the program. I either am in the lead or I don't do it, right? And all of us have had people in our lives like that, right? You're, you're a team member. They're a team member only if they lead the team, Okay? So the idea here is they're not rebellious, not arrogant, somebody who doesn't boast in their achievements. They're not prone to anger. Someone in, in, in anger is manifested in a lot of different ways, and we can't talk about them all today. Sometimes anger is manifested in right, passive-aggressive things where you check out. Well, I don't get my way. Well, fine. Then I'm just going to sit here and scowl at everybody in this meeting. I'm going to make everybody feel awkward right now. Right? I'm just going to be here. And, and uh, we've had those moments right, with our kids well, the one person decides this event is not the event I want to be at, so I'm going to ruin the event for everybody, right? And I know that's never happened to any of your families, but the idea here is you're not prone to anger. You don't get passive aggressive. You don't bully, right, when you don't get your way. And adults can be very sophisticated in bullying, right? They can ostracize people, right? I remember all those tricks in high school, right? You could really coerce somebody by just cutting them out of the group and you never had to say anything to them. You can bully people really easy. Okay, worst thing about a person that's a leader is that all of a sudden you use your position and your authority to lord it over someone. You coerce them. Not a drunkard, not someone who's dependent on alcohol to be who he wants to be, right? So he doesn't need a little lubricant, right, to get his beer muscles on, right? Or to wind down after dealing with the congregation all day, right? I need a beer bad today, right? I just met with my congregation. I need something, right? Something where you're dependent upon that kind of thing. I had one of my professors as just a, a friend and a mentor. Um, um, I, again, I've told you before, I don't think that you can make a case from Scripture that alcohol is liquid evil. I don't think so. I think it's something that's very powerful and you need to be very careful about. Some of you, it, it will own you if you drink it. Others of you can manage it very well to the glory of God. I think so. Uh, but when, when it comes to uh, those kinds of issues, he found himself that he was just getting in the process where he would go to teach and he'd come home at the end of the day and he would get out a beer and he would sit down. And he started to realize he was getting kind of a dependence upon that as a routine to get calmed down every day, like he needed a couple pills just to settle down at the end of the day. And it began to worry him. And so he cut it out because he didn't want that to be the reason that he was making it through the day. It's a short step from there from needing a, a drink during the day and a couple drinks during the day, and it alarmed him. He doesn't want to be owned by it, right? So not a drunkard, not violent, not someone prone to lash out, right? Now, I didn't tell you this story last week. I was coming home from uh, picking up my daughter's dog. That's enough of a story in and of itself. But I was picking up the dog. The dog got sick in her car on the, on the way to meet me halfway, and then it got sick in my car on the other half of the way. And the way it got sick in my car, it was disgusting. It was diarrhea in the car. Uh, thankfully, it was on his stuff and not mine, right? But I, I was driving along. The car starting to smell bad. And I'm thinking, this is really bad. And so I pull over, find out what it is, and I leave the car running. But when I pulled over in a rest stop, I had pulled over on the truck side instead of the, the uh, car side. And I was, wasn't thinking. I was just thinking getting that dog out of my car. So I, I literally, I leave the car running. And I grab the dog and run out to the grass spot out there. And of course, the dog does nothing because he's already done everything in my car, right? So I, I get out there, and I've got the dog out there to try to do that. And I turn around and look at my car, and there's a guy in a semi who is backing into my car. 
I mean, he's backing into my, well, nobody, there's no reason for a semi to back, right? The way these things are, you come in, you pull in your slot, and then you pull out. That's the way they are. Well, I, I run with this dog that had just messed up my car, and I'm running with the dog, and I'm, I'm, I'm all alarmed. Going, by the time I get there, without exaggeration, that semi trailer is about that far from my hood of my car. And I am banging on the side of the trailer. I'm getting in his rearview mirror and telling him to do that. Well, he was doing it on purpose. Because he was mad at me for pulling my car into the truck side of the rest stop. He was teaching me a lesson, right, in terms of that. Now, I don't know how I responded about that, but normally I don't run up to people's cars and bang on them, right, uh, or people's faces, right, or things along those lines. But a person who, when they get their will thwarted, they just lash out, right? That's not a, a godly man. They're not greedy. They're not working for a paycheck, right, or what the paycheck signifies, Right? In America, often we think the bigger the paycheck, the more important, the more valuable the person is. If, if a leader looks to a paycheck to distinguish his value, that's it's one of the troubling things sometimes among pastors is that very few people move downward in terms of their church pastoring career. Right? So, uh, and again, that's between them and the Lord, but not greedy. And then positively, uh, uh, faithful to his wife, Right? Uh, and this is the idea here, and again, there's a lot of differences of opinion here, but I think that the phrase is the quality of a person, that he's faithful to his wife. His wife knows that he has eyes for her and her alone, and so do the women in his ministry. So do the women in his ministry. They, they don't feel uncomfortable about him. Uh, matter of fact, uh, they, they may get frustrated at times because he's trying to take steps to make sure that he doesn't get himself in a position, given his own weaknesses, where he could be compromised. Right, there's, a, there's a frustration about that and difficulty, but I, I've told you many times the biblical metaphor that Paul uses all the time for me as a man is that the women in this church that are of my age are, are my sisters. The women that are older than me, which is getting fewer and fewer as I get older, the women who are older than me are my moms in the faith, and, and, and the women that are younger than me are my daughters. And, and that is a very powerful metaphor that says, well, I can talk deeply to them about spiritual things. I can talk to them about careers and life. We can talk about so many different things, but any kind of sexual, sensual, any type of relationship like that is completely out of bounds. So those are the kinds of things that, that my wife needs to know and every woman in this church needs to know for any pastor in this church that they're a, a man who literally is safe because they're not trying to exploit them. One of the characteristics, and we'll talk about this in a moment, characteristics of a false teacher is they're always looking at people who are looking for answers for life. They're, they're desperate for connection with God. They're trying to deal with difficulties. And an ungodly person, a person who's wicked, is looking for people to exploit. So always when you find charlatans or false teachers, you find three things usually going on. It's about sexual exploitation. It's about financial exploitation or it's about finding a group of people that will give you status and power. That's what we're going to find here that Paul warns them about here. So uh, hospitable here, open, welcoming, a lover of the good, all right, the, the, what, what the person pursues and goes after, prudent, wise choices, upright, they live in a way that corresponds to God's standard, devout, they are devoted to God, right? They are devoted to him and they're self-controlled, right? Their passions don't rule them. Right? And again, we're talking about patterns of life for a person. And so then a healthy leader, right? Why do we need them? A healthy leader, religious charlatans are on the prowl and the people are particularly vulnerable. Now I want to read this last section and, and just make some quick comments as we come to close today. For there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach and that for the sake of dishonest gain. One of Crete's own prophets has said it, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. That's, that's some hard words, is it not? Uh, today, in the culture in which we live, if there was a, a, a believer who, who uh, may have said this something about a given culture around the world, they would probably get, uh, call them being culturally insensitive, right? Or someone who needs to be. Now, what Paul's doing here, just to be careful, is he's making an assessment from the perspective of what God has called and enabled people to be, and he's using one of the Cretans to say these are true generally of the culture. And this was renowned in the ancient world. It's backed up by, uh, you can read about the Cretans. This is why you, we still have it in, in certain ways we call somebody is a Cretan, 
somebody who's just out of control and behaves and follows their passions, that kind of thing, because the Cretans were renowned for being lazy people because they, they, their trade literally floated to them on the Mediterranean Sea. They didn't produce things themselves. They just handled materials for people who were out there in the middle of the ocean. And they were also known for being cheats and liars because they were the, like the, you know, the, the only gas station within a thousand miles, right? And so people would come up to them and the Cretans were known for ripping people off, right? Matter of fact, it was a prized skill in Crete, right? As it is in some circles to walk away and say, man, I really got them for a lot of money. Because right? when you're out in the middle of the ocean, you need, you need provisions. Well, where are you going to get it? Well, this is the only place to get it. So you'll pay what you, you have to. Right? And then the third thing, and there's some very dark research that's come out of this, is that, that the Cretan culture was sexually depauched. And that's what he means by uh, evil brutes. They, they behaved like animals. And in particularly, there was a, 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 a particularly uh, egregious sort of cult that was there that, that majored in the abuse of children. So it's a very, very dark place. So he says here, this saying is true, therefore rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to merely human commands or of those who reject the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him and they are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good, right? Now, let me just say a couple things that he says here. When he talks about religious charlatans in verses 10 and 11, he talks about rebellious people. Notice how that's the opposite of an elder. An elder is someone who wants to live within the boundaries of God's prescription, and they're empty talkers and deceivers, right? This is said at the very end. What, what a charlatan wants to do because they want something from you that if you knew exactly what they were trying to get at, you would not be listening to them. So they have to deceive you about their motivations. They have to deceive you in their words to get you to be vulnerable to them so that they can exploit you on the other end. So they're empty talkers. They say things that don't matter. They think they're saying things, right? A charlatan, this is a distinction. A charlatan is trying to figure out what do I say to him? What do I say to her to get them to get in their pockets and give me money? What do I say? Right? So the health and wealth people, the scourge of, of the two-thirds world, you have people all over the world who are coming into communities that are impoverished and have longings for their kids and for their futures and are telling them that, you know, if you put money in the offering plate, you put money in the offering plate, your kids will be healthy you're going to get the best schools ever. Your life will be perfect. If you just trust me and give me all your money, then everything will work out well for you. Because that's what they long to hear. And that person plays and prays on their desperation to get them vulnerable to them so that he can exploit them. Right? And so one of the characteristics here that's implied of a, of a genuine follower of Christ is he will tell you what God says to be true even if you don't like it. He will tell you because he loves you more than he wants something for you. And if he's a lover of the good and he's a lover of Christ, he wants you to know the truth as Christ has revealed it for your sake and for the sake of your family. And so he's going to tell that to you even if you don't like him for it. And he's not going to do it with a high-handed, arrogant attitude. He's not going to do it in any of those kind of things like that. He's going to plead with you to listen to the call of Christ and not head down a path that's going to bring death and destruction to your life because he loves the good. So the issue here is they're going to tell you what they think. And he, he refers to the circumcision here, which is a way to refer to a particular group of Jews. And the reason why they would be so persuasive is that the Jews in this situation who don't believe in Jesus, they know their Bibles, right? And if a Christian doesn't know the truth, somebody comes in and sticks a Bible verse on it or says a couple words like grace or faith or whatever the case may be, and immediately somebody goes, oh, they must be a believer. Oh, they must know Jesus. Oh, they must know that. Well, if you've been around for any length of time, you know that that's, that's way, way too risky to make a judgment like that. I believe whatever somebody says about themselves, but at the end, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press in. I'm going to ask them some questions. Right? So if a person starts to ask me and talk about different things like that, and they're talking about faith and their beliefs and so forth. I want to say, well, what, when did you come to know Jesus? Tell me a little bit about your faith journey. Tell me a little bit about your faith. 
Man, that's so important to me, and it truly is. So tell me about that. So I, I want to know about that. And the issue here is you, somebody can put a little Bible verse on something, and people go, oh, that was a Bible. That must be good, right? Well, that can be done by people who are trying to deceive people as well. So but he says they must be silenced. And so this is a person that should not be allowed to occupy a position of authority or teaching within a church. No, they shouldn't be up front. So this assumes also that an elder at times not only has to be someone who positively proclaims the truth, but they need to be someone who's a shepherd who looks out for someone who's a hireling. And so even the quality of hospitable in the ancient church to be hospitable wasn't meaning just that you opened your home up to other people. The pastor is literally, and you'll read about this if you read First and Second John, is that the pastor is to be someone who looks at the church family and he should be someone standing at the door determining what sort of influences get into the body. So if a person calls me up and says, hey, I'd love to come minister in your church, well, one, we would look at them and what they believe and what they teach, and we'd determine whether or not we would let them come into the pulpit. Same time, we'll have curriculum choices that'll be made, and people will call me up and say, hey, Pastor Greg, would you look at this book and say, is this a good book for us to use, right, in case we've missed something? Now, there's many, many wise people here, but one of my jobs is to be someone who's watching. Now, just like a dad in the family or a mom in the family, one of the things that you should be doing, right, especially in this moment, that there should be no kid in this church who has control over the remote control of their TV. There should be no kid in this church who has uh, unmediated access to everything that they can get on their phone. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about just being a, a over-top people, but you ought need to open up a conversation. There is so much stuff out there, and people are after the hearts of your kids, right? I'm not trying to scare people. That's just the truth of it. And there's, it's an unwise parent who says, just be babysat by my iPad. That's just unwise, right? It's unwise. There's stuff on there that you, you are held accountable. They don't know better. You do. And you're held accountable for what you let them watch. And you need to watch out. You need to pay attention. And this is one thing that sometimes we as adults, the people that are, are trying to undermine your view of what you think is sexually appropriate, the, the people trying to undermine your understanding of what a family is, the people that are undermining how you relate to different people of different races and different things, they're busy working in the arena of kids. And Nickelodeon, and some of the famous shows that we have, they're, they're, they're busy. Just a recent report came out, that kind of thing. They're super busy, right? Now, this is not for us to be fearful, not for us to come back into some walled, you know, fortress. But we can't be, a, be naive about our kids. What you can process and what you can deal with as an adult, but you need to pay attention to what's happening. As a pastor, one of the things I'm supposed to be looking out for, the types of resources that are coming in that are trying to distort your vision of Jesus. They're trying to tell you that Jesus doesn't call you to do this or Jesus doesn't call us to do that. I, I, I'm, I'm supposed to be on guard, right, to watch. So uh, they silence, and they're often motivated by lust and greed. And then the people are particularly vulnerable, and we find ourselves too, all of us at every moment, the church up until Christ returns, we live as like little outposts in foreign territory. So when you come in here, um, in the academic arena that I grew up in, and I'll just return to this briefly, the academic arena that I got my PhD in, for me to tell the statement that I said this morning about our conviction from the scripture that only qualified men should be the leader of the church, I would be excoriated and cast out. Uh, and so even if you have an evangelical who's writing a dissertation within the area of biblical studies, uh, if you want to get through it, uh, you need to choose your topics very carefully. Right, depending on how things are there. And so the issue here is, one of the, one of the strange things here is, uh, I believe, I believe that there's no difference in value between men and women. I believe that God gives us an assignment in our gender that we're to live out to the glory of God according to his sacred order. And I think that's good for human beings as God has revealed it. And so I want to encourage that and I want to stand behind it, but it's not a view in our moment that's popular. Right? So uh, we, we're in a polluted culture. They were in a polluted culture, as all cultures are, until Christ returns. And it makes us vulnerable. Now, I've used this term with you before, but, you know, we're informed. How we process things is informed by the culture around us. One sociologist calls it a social imaginary. 
a way that we all imagine the world to be. What the Bible is after is trying to get us to imagine the world as it really is. That God is ruling and reigning, that he created us, that Christ came and died for us, that he's returning to wrap up what he's done, that we're living in anticipation of that, that our identity is the people of God. That's the world that we want to think about our lives in. And as we process things that come to us, we use that as a sift to say, no, that's not consistent with my identity. No, I don't have to have a million followers to be significant. I don't have to be. Matter of fact, I don't have any followers. Matter of fact, if I'm, a, if I'm, a, I'm in the desert of no social media, I can still live a fulfilled life as long as I'm faithful to Christ. Right? I don't have to have a lot of money to be significant, but what I really need is I re- need a relationship with Jesus Christ. I need to walk with him today. I don't know all the rest of the things that are going to happen. I'm going to trust him with the success of life. I don't have to have a book published. I don't have to be known by everybody. I don't have to be the most pro- popular person. When well, the culture in which we live, all those voices are out there. You need to imagine that, and you need to love these things and do these things. Well, God's saying, no, here's the most important person. It's Jesus. Here's your identity in him. Here's what's most important today for you. Live into that. Imagine the world in that way. And as you process the lives of people around you, do they love Jesus becomes your most important question. And if they love Jesus, are they following him? Do they listen to him? How can I be a part of helping them know and follow Jesus? So the issue here is they need for clear, honest, unflinching teaching that confronts sin and promotes pure devotion to God. When Paul says the pure, all things are pure, I think what Paul means is that the person who has God's heart, a pure devotion to God, you recognize evil as evil and good as good, right? When you get things screwed up, you think evil is good and good is evil, (laughs) right? All right, so do we as individuals as a church have the right perspective on who should lead our church? Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless. And so I end with these kind of questions. Do I, do we uh, want affirmers and entertainers or truth tellers? Do I or we want charisma or character? Right? Now, I want to I say this here is that uh, I'm not calling for, how do you know that there's a pastor? He's the most boring person you've ever met. That's a pastor right there. No, that's not what I'm talking about. But we all know the difference, right? I, I've got a person right in my mind. I love them, but they have charisma, but they have no character. And they use their charisma to work people. It's a good-looking guy, and man, is he charismatic. But his life is a wreck. And there's a difference between charisma and character. Uh, Charisma connected to character is something different. Do I want a business executive or a spiritual example? Do I want a man approved by God or a man approved by our contemporary culture? All right, I'm going to call an audible, Grayson, uh, for you today. And I just want to pray and end this. Uh, today, uh, much for us to think about. And I I end with this to say, all that you really have is that if a man is to be a pastor, he needs to meet these qualifications. But really all you have in this is a portrait for the most part of what a mature Christian looks like. That's just what a mature Christian looks like. This isn't qualities that only pastors are supposed to have. It should be true that we're all prudent, that we all love the good, right? That if you're in a marriage relationship, that you're faithful to your spouse, that you're not a violent person, that you're not easily angered. I mean, these, these are just the qualities of what it means to follow Jesus. And so this is the life that he's taking us toward, and these are the pastors that we ought to have by God's grace. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your mercies to us. Thank you for Jesus today. Uh, thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, we love you today. Lord, thank you that in Christ, Lord, you can take broken, failed people, people with regrets and scars, Uh, people with struggles and addictions. Lord, you can take us and forgive us, make us new. You can resource us with the Holy Spirit and your people to live a different kind of life. Uh, Lord, you can help us to deal with the failures of our past. You can help us to find grace over them. Lord, you can help us to to, uh, redeem the scars so that they become a a rich part of our life that enables us to love other people better. Uh, Lord, you can can, uh, take uh, uh, just uh, messes, Lord, and bring... Uh, order out of the chaos, and Lord, give us a purpose and mission. Oh, we're so grateful. Lord, help us as a church, Lord, to love you first and foremost. Help us to represent you first and foremost. Lord, may we hold on to you firmly. 
uh, Lord, above all. Lord, pray that in our families. Pray that for our kids, Lord, in school and at home. Lord, you reshape our relationships and our, our, our lives. And we give you the thanks and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Have a good day. I uh, hope I can see some of you back at 3 o'clock this afternoon uh, as we celebrate Ken Lurs.